as an experiencer, I want you to give us the impetus or your initiation into your first, I'm going to say in quotes, recalled experience, recalled experience that happened back in 1989 after returning from a 10 day vacation with your then girlfriend in Mexico. Yes. Take it away, Michael. Tell, tell the folks what happened to you. If you could give us kind of the condensed version. Okay. The condensed version is this. Um, We were in uh, Cancun and um, we wanted to go to Chichen Itza and Tulum on the Yucatan to see the pyramids and all the Mayan, uh, uh, you know, pyramids and that kind of stuff. And um, remember, I'm uh, backstory is, you know, I'm, I'm, I've broken away, obviously, from my Baptist upbringing and I'm reading existential philosophy. I mean, I'm, I'm doing my journey, but I never watched the Star Trek up until then. And I did not believe in this. And uh, I just I have to give that backstory. Um, and so we went and uh, uh, it was wonderful. It was, you know, I just to see the the pyramids and just to know about this civilization, very advanced, but that's, you know, we, there all these civilizations were very advanced. So anyway, we come back to JFK and my girlfriend, Sandy at the time said, I'm going to stay home. It was cold. We got back and it was 85, 90 degrees. I wanted to glow. And I was nice and coppery, my hair, I wanted to glow. So if some <laughs> friends had invited me uh, to a get together down in Hell's Kitchen um, on on forty forty sixth and forty fourth and tenth, and so I went, and it was cold, but still my ego. I just want people to say, "Ooh, wow, look!" At-. So I went, and no adult beverages were served. I, I had probably too many deviled eggs because that's my one I of know. my vices. I know. Woo! And uh, <laughs> uh, it's worth it. the box, the, the bottle of Tums afterwards for me. Anyway, so. Um, <laughs> I came back home and I was there about 90 minutes. And I, to this day, I, I don't know whether I, uh, you know, had to, to get up and go to the bathroom or whatever, but I sleep on my stomach, which I know is not the best. And I turned around and there was a being at the foot of my bed. And I, I can't tell you the fear. Okay, I mean, and Sandy could not wake up. And since I've written a book and talked about this, she has since recalled, she said, Michael, I remember there were these shadowy beings in the room with these big heads. She said, but that's all I remember. And she said, I just felt like I just had to go to sleep. But anyway, um, this being was about maybe four feet tall. Uh, uh, The jumpsuit, it was a jumpsuit and it looked like Reynolds wrap. I I remember that. And this is the 15th floor of the Excelsior Hotel, which is still there on the Upper West Side, 45 West 81st Street, between Columbus Avenue and the park, right across the street from um, uh, the planetarium. So it wasn't in some rural little area. This was in a crowded city. And I, uh, I, I, I was just so scared. And the being had... Uh, was 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 chalk white, with the big bulbous head and those eyes, and real real thin. And behind him was or her was a this individual. I don't know what sex it was. Was a cobalt like a deep blue, almost like the blue of my book. And on side of, outside of that was um, white. My whole apartment, our whole apartment, it was lit up like Times Square. And I got in a fetal position and I pulled the covers up over my head. Sandy didn't budge. She was asleep. So she stayed yeah. asleep. Yeah, 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 yeah. She said a couple of weeks ago when, when the book came out, she said, I remember it. Now, she said, I saw these shadowy beings, but the, there was something in my head that just said, go to sleep. So she, she was, saw them. How did she see them if she was asleep? She said that before, when I got up, it, it, it you know, she, she felt me moving around. And she said, I saw these shadowy beings with these heads, but the normal reaction would be probably like I did to sit up on your bed. She went 
to sleep, mm-hmm. which is not a normal reaction. Well, it, you, you hear this a lot, actually, where the partner... I mean, not well, because they put something on her to say, why don't you just... This is not for you. I don't know. But she said, I saw, but she did, she said, I couldn't do anything but go to sleep. So I pull the covers up over my head and I hear this whoosh, like this wind whoosh, blowing and the temperature has changed in the room and I think I'm outside. I, I think I'm outside. It's like it's freezing. When I pull my covers down, near a dog bark. It was like nothing ever happened. And when she got up and she said, I remember you, she said, I've never seen you so afraid. And that was December 28th, 1989. And then, you know, that was, that's just the truncated version. They kept coming twice a month, every full and new moon. You mentioned for about that. eight months or 12. And it was interesting because, Sandy worked at night. She had a job. She was she was an entertainer, so her club dates were at night. And so th- they would come almost a good year. And in between that time, I had seen them. I mean, they weren't gray. They were chalk white, but we wouldn't call them the phenotype is like. And I saw reptilians on two occasions. And only later on when I moved here did I see the Nordic brother and that um, the the Arcturian, the blue person, and the praying mantis. But in there, because it was interesting, when I talked to my friends in Europe, when I was telling them about this, they said, oh, we don't really see them. We we see the blonde, blue-eyed people. I said, well, I don't see them over here. And then, of course, years later, I did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They, they, they were the ones who healed my blood clot. Right. We're going to get into that. Yeah. yeah we're going to. We're going to yeah, get into they, that. They, they hooked that up really nice. That's that's a fabulous story. Here's a question I have for you. Well, let's stay on the 1989 experience because I'm again I'm calling this your first recalled experience. Yeah. Do you feel, Michael? Now look at where you had just come from. Not just Mexico, but the Mayan pyramids. Do you feel? Have you ever explored the thought that something may have happened while you were in the proximity of that mm-hmm. very powerful area, even subliminally? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thoughts on that. that. What are your thoughts I, on that? I thought about that. You know, <clears throat> pardon me, Alexis, I, you know, with this type of material and with this, anything is possible. Mm-hmm. All I know is that things that I never even gave, even thought about, I started thinking, I started changing. Um, um, physiologically, my hair grew faster, my nails grew faster. I got by on less sleep. Um, Something was softened in me. I was more willing to be vulnerable. There was a depth to me. Now, that wasn't like I wasn't working towards that before. But before this happened, you know, I was an actor in New York. You know how that goes. I was drinking and sexing and drugging. And I was having a grand time. And then this happened. And the brakes got put on. Uh, And I had several other times where I, not anything like this, where you know, I, 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 you know, life was warning me, you're going to do something stupid to yourself if you're going to keep partying like this. But this put the brakes on. And no, no one ever said to me, this is, you shouldn't be doing this. It was that it just gradually came to me like, is this what you really want to do? You know, is this what you really think you're here for? And I, and I jokingly say to my friends, I went to New York thinking I was going to be Denzel Washington. Mm -hmm. And I wound up going to seminary, even though in some ways that was not totally unexpected, Mm -hmm. but my whole life changed. And, but I saw my experience as positive overall. And that's when I met Bud and John Mack and well, let's and talk also, about that. Let's let's talk yeah. about that because I know that there's a lot of moving parts to your story. Let's talk about Bud because yeah. I want to get into yeah, the but... merits of therapy of hypnotherapy. Oh. Tell us how many times did you meet with him? I met Bud Hopkins, with by the way, twice, and I met with Jean Mundy the first time. I met with her twice. Jean Mundy, I found her name in a book called Encounters by Dr. Edith Fiore. Mm-hmm. And in the back of the book, you know, there's all this, all these folk all over the country 
who were doing mental health stuff and they were working with experiencers. Um, and that, and it was, it was two, it was a woman named Aphrodite Claymore and there was Jean Mundy. And it was my bias. I, I was in such bad shape mentally that someone named Aphrodite, I know it's the Greek goddess, I just couldn't handle that. <laughs> it just didn't seem grounded enough for mm -hmm. me. And I hear she's wonderful at what she does. But where I was, I needed to be grounded. So it was Dr. Jean Mundy. She had an office in Long Island and one on East 13th Street in the village. Mm -hmm. I went there. I still have the cassette tapes back there of me screaming at the top of my lungs. But wow. during the regression, um, but it, she let me know that I wasn't crazy, which I thought I was. I was not sleeping. Um, you know, I still have some post-traumatic stress. It takes me, I'm better, but I still have to wait. I still have to wait before I'm ready to go to sleep. Your, your sanity's on the line. You know, I, I mean, I thought I was crazy. And and the hits just kept on coming. And I wasn't sleeping and, and right. you know, it was catching up with me. I started healing after that, playing with all these energies because uh, I like that, you know, and, and it was great. My life was changing. But, you know, you got to sleep. You have to sleep or else you, you got, can't you function. Eat. Yeah, you have to function and you have to, you know, I had to go to work. And uh, and I was, you know, who are you going to talk to about this? I'm not going to talk to my church about it. Well, I want to talk about that because, because at some point it came. Me. Yeah. Tell us uh, what happened. You know, Tell us what happened there. Oh, um, well, you're bringing up some stuff for me. <laughs> Sorry. It's for the journeyers. It's the thank you for this, by the way. So anyway, I, I was telling a friend of mine, um, I was going to Boston to do some anti-racism training. And uh, I remember, I, I, I won't mention her name, she had a, a, a purple Jeep. And we were riding and it was, I said, I've never seen a purple Jeep. And I, I felt close to her. She was a minister, a good friend. And and I told her what happened. And um, and she said to me, Michael, I believe that's possible. She said, but if you ever want to have a um, career in this denomination, you must never tell that story again. And so I didn't. And then when I got this gig, when I'm serving this congregation here now, this was several years ago, though, there was a woman there, and she's very difficult, and we've healed a little bit. I just saw her a couple of weeks ago, um, but she wanted me fired because she said I turned on the TV and my my pastor's talking about little green men, which that's not what I was talking about. And she said she was embarrassed about it, and she was giving much money to the church, so I didn't know which way this was going to go. And we met uh, my board. And she came in and I tried to talk to her. Um, and luckily they stood up for me. They said, A, he doesn't preach it from the pulpit. So he's not forcing this on us or you. And he may be right. But I don't understand what, why we need to go to this extreme. So I will always thank them for that. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And, you know, uh, and, you know, that was my livelihood. She was trying to get me fired. Um, but I just, I'm a little emotional. I just never thought, I mean, I thought I had healed some of that. But obviously, it's still, some of that's still there. Mm 